This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is proudly brought to you by White Rock Decoys. Got decoy envy? Don't. When you figure out you don't need a giant trailer full of heavy, expensive full-body decoys to compete with the big boys, you just need their numbers. And you can build your spread bigger, quicker, and lighter without sacrificing on quality gear and do it out of the back of your truck. Everything starts to click and you're ready to roll with White Rock. White Rock decoys offer premium engineered decoy systems for the new generation of mobile waterfowl hunters. Use code HPOutdoors to get 10% off your next order at whiterockdecoys.com. White Rock decoys, be a nomad. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 91. This week on the show, it's story time, as we're joined by one of our good buddies, Travis Laird. We talk about his journey into becoming a waterfowl hunter. All right, welcome to this, the 91st episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where you're on demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. Check us out at hpoutdoors.com. Find us across all the social media platforms out there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're on Facebook, head over to our HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast listeners group. Join a bunch of people in there that uh, listen to the show and like to engage in good waterfowl discussion. If you're new to the show, you can catch up with all of the past episodes at iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play Store, everywhere you can find quality podcast content, you can find our show. This week's episode is brought to you in part by Gunner Kennels, engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard and put Gunner Kennels in a category all its own. Gunner Kennels was started to protect your pet, and it continues to be at the center of everything that they do. Gunner Kennels was dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market. Man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. This episode is also brought to you in part by Lucky Duck. The only creature that they can't deceive is you. Lucky Duck is more than a brand. It's a lifestyle built around the subtle art of critter deception. While you're focused on the business end of your shotgun or rifle, know that they're completely focused on what matters most, you. Whether you're in the duck blind, dove field, or a predator stand chasing turkeys, whatever it is, they're confident that their product will help you succeed. Check out their full lineup at luckyduck.com and keep up with the latest news by following them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, we would like to thank Camp Chef, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Southern Oak Kennels, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy for their support of this week's episode. Make sure you head over to the HP Outdoors website, check out our discounts codes. You can find out how to save 10% off at Dunn Sporting Goods, 15% off with Black Rifle Coffee Company, 10% off of White Rock Decoys, and get a special discount on a 737 duck or goose call, that custom HP calls that you've seen floating around on the internet. You can also check out the hats that we have for sale on the website while you're there and uh, pick one of those up if you haven't had an opportunity yet. Joining me this week, as he always does, is Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up, man? Not much. I'm sitting in Trav's uh, kitchen here and watching him jot down a few notes that start with your name and he has a little smirk. So this is going to be quite an interesting episode, I think. <laughs> well, I think one of the reasons we did this episode was because we got a lot of really good feedback about the episode that we did with your brother that you, the interview that you did with your brother and just kind of telling stories and, and shooting the bull a little bit. And, um, you know, to give, give everybody a little bit of background on Trav, he's, you know, we've known him since we were, we were little played baseball together for years and years. Um, Travis and I went to college together, played together at Penn state, lifelong hunter, um, Hunter family, his mom, his dad, his sister, everybody in the family spends time in the outdoors together. And, you know, Travis, like me and, and you for a good, a good portion, uh, you know, grew up chasing whitetails, turkeys. And as he's gotten older, he's evolved into, you know, chasing elk out West and doing some other things. And probably most recently he's been getting into the waterfowl hunting scene, uh, with us. And, you know, we kind of thought that talking about his sort of journey into that might be something that a lot of guys can relate to. So we'll cover that. And I think uh, along the way, we'll probably hit a lot of stories that, 
it will be funny to some people, probably be more funny to us just because we live them. But uh, hopefully it's something that everybody will enjoy. So uh, you know, we're excited to welcome Travis to the show. Travis, what's up, man? Fellas, <laughs> how's it going? Good, man. You're, uh, here. you're uh, you know, living across the pond currently. So it's good to have you back stateside here and uh, excited to chat with you a little bit about your waterfowl journey and everything that's kind of coming up. But um, maybe let's talk a little bit about how, how, how has it been living in London and knowing that hunting season's coming up and, you know, how have you thought about sort of the, how the fall is going to look for you? And I know you sent us that picture of you've been, you've been buying a lot of gear online and shipping it back to your, your parents' place. So when you got, when we got back stateside, you had a nice little care package waiting for you, but talk Here's to us a little bit about that. Yeah, actually this is my, our first time back. So we've been living in London since January and haven't been homesick really at all. And then I just telling Dan earlier, I got up this morning early and drove by one of the marshes that we hunt. And I was like, man, I am going to miss October 6th. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, be one sad fella living in London when you guys are, or at least Dan's going to be burning up the, probably the wood ducks. Um, I did see one hen woody fly over, buzz my tower. Um, but it's been good. I walk around, you know, London, you have to walk around a lot and, um, when I walk into work, sometimes I walk right by um, the pond in St. James's Park, which is near um, Buckingham Palace, and it's always just full of ducks. I sent last year I walked <laughs> by and I sent Dad a picture of a bull can, uh, and I was just like, "Oh man!" But uh, I don't think the the Queen would think highly of me setting up a blind in her Take, front yard. You could just <laughs> you could just get a good water swat in real quick. Yeah, I could. Yeah, <laughs> but you are you will be back for elk hunting and then. Are you going to do any waterfowling? Will you be back? Yeah. So uh, w- mid-September, I'm flying from London to Denver and then driving across the state um, to hunt with my parents and a good friend from growing up elk hunting. And then I think I'd, I'll definitely be back for the late season waterfowl. So hopefully we have some good weather. I'll probably be back one other time in November. Um, depends on if there's any birds around, though, I guess. Nah, we'll find some. We'll find some for sure. Um, there's so many ways to go here. I think maybe just talk about growing up, growing up with the, uh, your parents, like Josh was saying, your hunting family. Um, there's no denying that your mom kills more animals than Everybody. anyone else, mm-hmm. <laughs> which you guys might set her up or you may not, but she's always slaying. So just talk about that. Maybe, you know, your dad now and it'll be a little more difficult being over in London to get your kids growing up as hunters, but um, maybe just showing yeah. showing them the ropes when you are at home. Yeah. So I have I have two girls, a four year old and a two year old, and the four year old likes to be outside, but she hasn't really shown any interest in hunting. I think the two year old is going to be a little killer. <laughs> <laughs> She's got the twinkle in her eye. <laughs> uh, but when I was growing up, I was with my dad most of the winters because he worked construction and he was laid off when the weather got bad. So I would just go hang out with him. He was cutting wood or whatever. And, um, he was always hunting and I just, you know, I, I didn't know anything else. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Um, when he brought like a deer or bear home, but the first, when I really got the itch, I was, I think I was six or seven years old and I was homesick from school. And it was the second day of gun season in PA. And my dad was off. And he's like, hey, you think you feel okay enough to go sit in the tree stand (laughs) with me? (laughs) And I said, okay, dad. So I had like a fever of 103 or something like that. And he he bundled me all up and carries me to the tree stand. This is down at our farm. And uh, we're sitting there. And I'm just kind of hanging out. Nothing's really happening. And then all of a sudden this buck just comes, rise, rises up out of the goldenrod field. And my dad said, there's a buck. And he shoots it. And I was like, oh, man, that was crazy. <laughs> and so we get down, we find some blood, we go back to the house, and then we tracked it, and he got the deer. And I was hooked after that. I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, so, and my mom has 
she didn't she didn't hunt really when I was growing up because she was typically taking care of me and my sister. But once we all st- were of age to hunt, we've all it was a kind of a family ordeal. And um, like Dan said, my mom kills most of the animals in our household. My I was just downstairs and uh, I counted the number of species that are hung on the wall. <laughs> Black bears, antelopes, mule deer, white tails, ringneck pheasants, spring, eastern turkeys, two elk in the garage. And so it's been a real joy um, to spend that kind of quality time with my family. Uh, and I owe it all to really my dad and mom who just put it, put it in my brain that um, being outdoors and specifically hunting um, was the way of, way of life I wanted to live. So it will be hard living in London, but um, I'm going to make a point of it to come back every once in a while to get uh, get some trigger time in. You know, is too. Is there? I was just I was wondering. Are there? There's some people in our group that aren't too far away from you over there that you might be able to. I'm sure you're busy with work and everything, but you might be able to connect over there and try it out. Yeah, I've been looking into clubs a little bit. Um, it's a little pricey, but. I think I'll definitely try to get a couple hunts in, at least a pheasant hunt and then maybe one duck hunt. The way they hunt over there, I just want to do it to see how they do it because right. it's totally different. Um, but maybe we can do an episode on that too after I get that under the belt. That'd be cool. Yeah, I just wanted to jump back real quick because, <clears throat> you know, I spent a lot of time hunting with you and your family too. And just to kind of echo some of the things that you've said, you know, you're you're probably one of the only families that I know where – you know, in the spring, one morning, your dad is out and calling turkeys in for your mom. And then the next morning he's on the gun and she's calling turkeys in for him. Um, it's just, a, it's really cool to see how she, you know, has really just kind of got involved with it to that level. And, you know, I, I'll say this. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, your dad has, has spent, you know, his life in the woods, you know, he guided out in Colorado out of high school and, you know, it was just, He's just one of those guys, and I'm sure everybody listening to this show probably has someone like this in their life that, you know, it's just, they're just the the best outdoorsman you know, right? I mean, it's like, there's nothing when it comes to hunting that he's not good at. He's the type of guy where it seems like he always sees game, right? And it's not luck, right? I mean, there's always people that you see, they're out, you know, they see more deer, they see more turkeys, they get on more game, you know, they put more time in, you know, and for me, your dad was always like that. And the thing that's funny about your dad to me is that, you know, he, he pulled you along as, as his son for a, a period of time. And then it was, okay, you're, you're old enough to do it on your own now. Like we're going to hunt. So like when you're in the field with him, you got to keep up. Cause he, 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 he's like one of the fastest walkers in the woods you've ever seen. <laughs> um, which is, is, which is one, one kind of story with him, but I think it'd be funny to tell the story about how he shot. Was it a doe that he shot out from under you as a no, kid? It was a buck. Oh, a buck. I was 12. It was my first. It was my <laughs> oh, that's first right. It was your first <laughs> legal season. hunt. <laughs> and, and he had shot a gobbler in the spring and he shot a bear, a bear a couple weeks or probably a week before. So he really wanted a triple trophy <laughs> and a triple trophy in Pennsylvania is a turkey, a bear and a, and a buck. And so I'm sure people can relate to this too. There's a stand that we had. It's called the big gun stand. And it's about 20 feet in the air and you can see everywhere. And we, if you're in that stand, you're going to kill a deer. And so it's first thing, this buck steps out into the, into the path. I'm lining it up. I would think I was shooting that 22, 250. It was like a woodchuck gun. It had a <laughs> barrel on it. It was like 15 pounds. Um, but I got it in my sights and I'm ready to pull the trigger and I hear boom. And the deer just drops out of my scope. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I didn't shoot. And I look over, smoke's coming out of my dad's gun barrel. He's <laughs> halfway down the tree going to get the deer. But uh, And so I learned from then on, you got you to gotta be on your toes when you're hunting with him. And you guys know, I am very fast out of the blind. <laughs> oh, yeah. One of the, one of the when fastest. When somebody calls a shot, I am out of the blind. And I've got some... <laughs> I've got some... <laughs> Some shells in the air before anybody else does. Yeah, the the apple the dad. apple didn't fall far from the tree on that on that one for sure. Yeah, and so just on that triple trophy, he's got he's got the pictures down on the wall with the bear rug. <laughs> <laughs> You're standing, standing next to the buck. Crying. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's been good. I and Josh, we hunted a lot in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, 
mostly, mostly deer hunting, uh, a little bit of turkey hunting, but, um, you know, you moved down to, to, to Virginia and I think, what was it? Five or six years ago. Yeah. You've told the story how you got into waterfowl hunting. Um, but I think you were setting up a hunt and you asked, asked if I wanted to go it was in Maryland in the Eastern shore. I said, yeah. And I just went just because I wanted to hang out with you guys. And it was fun. We killed, we, I think we killed a limit every day when we were there the first year. Um, some days were a little quicker than others. Um, but I, I was just hunting in my hunting clothes that I had for deer hunting or turkey hunting. And, um, we came back and then I think we went the next year. And then the year, the third year we went, it was, it wasn't cold, but it was real windy. And I still had not yet invested in good gear. And we're out, and that was when we had that really awesome canvas back hunt. Mm -hmm. it, but it was the coldest I have ever been. <laughs> it felt like I had two ice blocks, cinder blocks for feet, and I just couldn't, I couldn't get my feet warm. And after that, I was like, enough is enough. I am going to figure this out because it's just my, it's my feet and my hands that get cold. So um, after that, I really started to, to invest in some good gear. And I think I've got a pretty good system down. Um, well, if I, I, if, at least if I can, I can stay in the blind. If I remember that, that year uh, was the, that was the first year your dad came down with us. And I believe you both bought like, $70 waiters on sale or something mm -hmm. at, at Gander. And, yep. you know, Dan and I were kind of like, all right, you know, let's see, you know, may, you know, they were neoprene, whatever. And I think we were still wearing neoprene at the time. I think, I believe Dan was wearing the Drake ones that had the leak in the crotch and I was wearing the Cabela's ones that I had. And I just remember how cold you were that morning. Like you could not sit still to save your life. I remember you just getting out of the blind and taking laps just to kind of, and then I'd look over and you'd be yeah. sitting down with your, you'd have your waiters off and your feet rubbing them. And just, it was nonstop, just a struggle all morning for you that day. It was awful. And it's hereditary too. So my dad has given me some good qualities and some bad qualities. And the, the worst one is cold feet, no matter <laughs> the temperature. Um, but, and I was also guzzling coffee so I could stay warm. <laughs> and so I had, I was either going out of the blind to run around to get warm or to go, you know, take a leak out, out the back and almost, um, you know, every time I'd go out, there'd be some geese coming in. But so now I've got a good system. I've, I've got it figured out. My Dan can attest to this. We hunted last year in, it was five degrees the one day. Um, and so here, you ready for my system from to keep your feet warm? Yeah, well, this was we weren't we weren't sure if we were going to call this episode "Foot Care with Trav" or "Story Time," but we figured so many rabbit holes would well, have I, gone down. Before, that we, before we get into this, hold on, I want to just point out one more thing. So the year after, again, so that was your dad's first year hunting with us down there at the Eastern Shore, and to my knowledge, he hadn't really done a lot of duck hunting up to that point. No. Maybe when he was younger, but you know, not certainly not that recently. And the following year. Um, Dan went on a Colorado elk hunt for like 10 days and, you know, us three, you and Dan and myself had kind of been the three mainstays in, on this hunt and kind of every other year we'd sort of had a fourth kind of fill in just whoever wanted to come or who was available. So that year that Dan went on the elk hunt, he wasn't able to come down to Maryland because he had, you know, the kids and stuff and, you know, a little too much strain, strain at home. So we were kind of thinking, well, we'll just take this year off. And we had kind of thought about not going. And it was actually your dad that called me out of the blue one day and said, Hey, <laughs> if I call down there, would you want to go on a hunt? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and so we ended up going a year without Dan and, um, you know, it was because your dad actually called and, and sort of pushed it. Cause if it wasn't for that, we probably wouldn't have gone, uh, that particular year. So, I, uh, I always thought that was kind of fun and I enjoyed that hunt. And I think we shot snow geese that hunt. That was the first time I'd shot snow geese down at the shore. So, uh, that was memorable, yeah, was memorable will, for that reason. Yeah. My dad will, you know, if they, if there's hunting on the agenda, he's in. Yeah. Um, but, but you mentioned that snow goose hunt and we're talking about why I got into waterfowl hunting. There's, there are two, um, moments that 
in the field that hooked me on waterfowl. And it wasn't the first couple times that we were hunting Canada geese. Dan and I, Dan would just, you know, typical, uh, typical Dan fashion, call me at like 10 o'clock at night and be like, hey, you want to go hunting in the morning? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So we went, um, it was the day after Christmas, or two days after Christmas, and it was like 60 degrees. Um, and we went down to one of the swamps, and we you have to paddle out like, I don't know, a mile, almost, half mile at least. So Dan was in the canoe, and there's a couple other guys. My dad was with, was with us too. And we weren't really seeing much. And then, like, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the weather changed, and it was a stiff northwest wind. And it was just like the birds came out of nowhere. They, they were migrators for yeah. sure. And it was about 40 mallards. And I had never seen anything like it. They, they were um, – it was like a tornado of mallards. And I thought, oh man, this is a ticket. This is what I want to do. <laughs> we didn't shoot, and we didn't even shoot, we shot some birds that day, but none none out of that group. No, they circled forever. Yeah, it was probably and... five minutes. They circled, maybe mm-hmm. not that long. It seemed forever. And then the other time, Josh was that snow goose hunt because I had never really had any desire to to go and shoot snow geese. And the that day, the the clouds were really low, and you could hear them off in the distance. And so the guide, and I think you've told the story on here. And I've, you know, I've killed, by this time, I have killed ducks and geese, and um, I knew what it was all about, I thought. And those snow geese come down below the clouds, and I got to tell you, I was shook. I mean, there, <laughs> and it wasn't even like a group of 5,000 or whatever. I don't know, what was there, 500 snow geese there? And I just couldn't, I couldn't get over the sight. It was like there were snow geese everywhere. And when he called it, they, they, you know, we all started shooting, they just start, started falling out of the sky. Um and that was another time where I just, I thought this is, and I still hunt, you know, I still go whitetail hunt and I love, I love elk hunting too, but waterfowl is my sport now, I think. Well, and I think the interesting thing about that hunt, man, you know, none of us at that point had really any experience hunting snow geese and we had been killing, can- we'd been killing Canada geese that morning out of that spot. And we'd heard birds off in the distance coming off this basically, um, river refuge area and coming over us. And, you know, we've hunted down there before where we've seen the massive flocks of snows coming over us. And the guide's like, yeah. he's like, nah, they're not going to do it. Like, you know, we're just watching them fly over. And I'm like, uh, can we try? Like, he's like, he's like, I know, I know what you guys are thinking. He's like, just trust me. Like those ones aren't going to do it. And we're sitting here in the blind that morning killing Canada's. And all of a sudden we hear these, this group of snow geese get up. And almost immediately, the guy's like, all right, these ones are going to do it. Load your guns. And he, he asked the guy, and he normally doesn't shoot with us, um, but he knew what was about to go down. And he he told the, the other guy that was with us helping set up decoys and stuff, he's like, load my gun. <laughs> and it was like, almost immediately, we're like, oh, man, like, it just took a different. It's it, on. Yeah, it took a yeah. different vibe in the blind. We're like, oh, damn, like, this is about to go down. And he's calling and he's like, get ready, boys, get ready, get ready. And I'm just like, you know, getting so excited. And sure enough, it was kind of like a low, um, you know, like, like you, you describe a low clouds, a little bit of fog. And they just materialized out of nowhere and they were on top of us. And he's just like, get them boys. And we just start tearing them up and they just start dropping. It was awesome. I mean, such a cool experience. So, um, you know, I, I, I think back to that, that hunt in that time. And if it wasn't for your dad calling me in the summertime and being like, Hey, let's do this anyway. Um, you know, we wouldn't have got to experience that. So just another, another moment of my hunting life that your dad's had a pretty positive impact on. So, yeah, well, another thing about that hunt is and a lesson from my dad he um, basically forced me to bring a backup gun to the blind, and I had just bought that new SB2, yep. and it wasn't ejecting shells. And so I, w- I was basically a single shot for a portion of the hunt. And um, so finally I just pulled my A300 out of the, out of the, um, out of the bag, and birds started falling when that thing yep. came out, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the one time Josh, um, a group came in, and you were on the far on the right side of the blind. I was on the left side of the blind, and I was I was shooting the A three hundred at this time, and we shot a couple Canada's out of the group, and the Canada in front of me just fell right in, right in the spread, dead. The one on the right side landed and took off for about three hundred yards, <laughs> and the guide went and got it, but. It did have a band on that goose. That's right. Ooh, that's right. It yeah. was, was a banded so local. I, I, 
I couldn't uh, claim the band because... Uh, well, of course not, because every, every bird you shot, you just stone right in the decoys. I like to, I, you know, it, I like to yeah. wing them. Let, them, let it, it be a little more sporting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <clears throat> so let's talk about your, your uh, journey of foot care. Yeah. Because this is, uh, for people that don't know what we're talking about, it is probably the biggest issue that you face during a hunt. Single-handedly. Once it starts getting cold, there are electric socks, there are hand warmers that go down the boots, or waders, waders off nonstop, a lot of movement, and uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, and it really is, and it's been, I've, it, it may seem like a trivial thing, but if you can't stay warm in the blind, then, you know, you're only good for a couple hours, and you may miss the best part of the hunt. So, I finally took the time to get a system. I tinkered. I tinkered a little bit. <laughs> he tinkered a ton. So what I do now is I, I've tried the double sock method and I think that just makes my feet colder. Even two wool socks or one like liner sock and a, and a wool sock. So I don't do that anymore. I go one wool sock. Merino typically, which Dan can appreciate, I'm sure. I think he's probably rocking some Merino socks right now. <laughs> who, who, Dan Merino? <laughs> <laughs> so I go, I go Merino wool sock and i bought these rechargeable uh thermosol uh foot warmers and they last about two hours so once i've got those on my feet are cooking they're feeling good that's that's the first two hours of the hunt then i stock my blind bag with a variety of uh hot hands and foot warmers that i can place strategically on my feet whether it's the toes or the heel to get them warm again. So that typically is about, let's say we start shooting light is at 6 a.m. So I'm good till 8 a.m. with the thermosoles. I take those, the, the, the waders come off. <laughs> I take the waders off at least probably two or three times in a hunt. The waders come <laughs> off. Then I go with the, with the auxiliary heat of the, uh, <laughs> of the foot warmers, place them on my toes because it's the toes that really get you. If you can't keep the toes warm, then then you then you may as well not even be out there. So I go, I place them directly. They have like these little sticky things on them so that the toe warmers, I go right on the toes. And then I go another foot warmer on the rest of the foot. And then once you get that heat going in the wader boot, then it's like a little oven. And, you know, he, you know, heat begets heat, I guess. I don't know <laughs> if that's, if, you know, <laughs> true in physics or what, but it seems like it works for my feet. So that lasts... That lasts probably two or three hours, and that typically gets me through a hunt. If we're in a, an all-day hunt, then I just, you know, rinse and repeat with the, uh, <laughs> with the, with the heater, <laughs> the foot warmers. So, so usually during a hunt, like you'll go and you'll talk. Hey, do you guys think we should move some decoys? You know, what what do you think about this over here? You know, uh, the winds the wind change, but no, like when it's Trav and, and his dad, it's like, hey, your feet warm enough? Yeah, Dad, my feet are sweating. All right, you got any more of them hand warmers? And it's just nonstop back and forth. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to go back to the truck. There's more hand warmers in the truck. <laughs> oh, my gosh, guys. But it, it is, I guess, I'm, I'm happy I don't have to deal with it, but definitely something that is paid attention to quite a bit when they're doing it. But I'm, I think I think something that we talk about all the time is when you need to adjust something in the field, I feel like you're... I don't know if this issue has helped because if they're, if decoys do need moved or something like that, I think hunting with you has helped me. Like it's okay to get up and move around and, and change that to where you're comfortable and confident in your setup, which from your feet, it's now going to the actual hunt, but it has, it has transferred a little bit in that regard. I am quite inquisitive as well <laughs> about the decoy spread that, that Dan recommends I've never seen the cat. I don't think you've ever done the cat paw with with you and I because we're typically <laughs> no. because we're typically in a in a. So I I'll goose hunt, but I I the thing that I want to do is hunt ducks, whether it's divers or 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 puddle ducks. But um, I I do like to make the adjustment. I'm also I think it's because I was a baseball player and baseball players are notoriously superstitious. Yeah. So. I'm always experimenting with the combination of hat and gloves. I've, oh my I've got probably three pairs. Of, I'm always on the lookout for, 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 the, for the best pair of gloves. Well, and, no, that, and no, that's, hat, glove, hat, glove, and neck gator combo. Yeah, that's, that's true. It is. That's deeply rooted, though, because 
your family has the buck hat, which is literally a hat with yeah. a picture of a buck on it. And literally every time someone wears it, they shoot a buck. So that has been deeply ingrained in your, in your uh, upbringing. Or in your case, just a misfire with a flintlock. Correct. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> so, yeah, so talk about this rotation that you use with Okay. The- yeah. So, and I'm before we go to that, I'm surprised that you put your rechargeables on so quick cuz usually the walk in your feet should be warm, right? Or do you turn those on once you get set up? I'm telling you, if no, I I I turn them on as soon as I put them in as soon as when we get to the truck, I put the thermosoles in, turn them on. Okay. Cuz if I if my Is feet get cold, they sweat? yeah, they sweat, but you, you that's why you just got You gotta, just got to live in a sweat. Yeah, I know about that. Of course you do. <laughs> But okay, so the hat <laughs> hat glove combo. So neck gator combo. My I don't really have is, uh, heat or or cold issues with my head, so I can wear a, a baseball cap or a a beanie. Um, and then I have three pairs of gloves in my blind bag. I've got <laughs> a pair of Gore Tex, actually cycling gloves, because um, they're the only Gore Tex gloves that I could find that had a little bit of um, that you could still have some dexterity. Then I have a pair of uh, Under Armour gloves that are kind of like a neoprene material. And then I have a pair of uh, Sitka Traverse liners. And then I have a, be- a, ball- a Sitka ball cap. So I'm a Sitka guy too. Sorry, everybody. But um, it goes back to that cold day in the field. I decided I'm going to invest in good gear. And Sitka is good gear. Um, and so I've got a multitude of hats. So if, if the if the action's good, I'll stick with my original. I typically lead with the Sitka gloves and a beanie. And then if it if I need to change it up, I'll go gator on the neck, ball cap, different gloves. It seems to work pretty good. I used to have a uh, chewing tobacco problem <laughs> that, I've, that I've since kicked. So I can't do the rally dips anymore. So I had to I had to experiment a little bit with my glove combo. So I, I want to bring up two points really quickly. The first being we've talked a lot about your struggles with cold weather. And what a lot of people probably don't know is that when we post episodes on, on Facebook and stuff like that, we've used a lot of pictures that you're in just because you hunt with us a lot and you happen to be the model that we, we have to use a lot. And the majority of them are like some of the coldest hunts like ever. It's just like you, yeah. you just getting crushed by the elements, which I find hilarious. And the other part yeah. is the other part is you've referenced throwing things in your blind bag a lot. Are you still rocking the full rucksack as your blind bag or have you downsized from that? No, I got, I got the, uh, the half choke or the, the sling choke. The sling. Um, oh, okay. You know, Sitka. Oh, so okay. it's, I don't have quite the amount of cubic inches in there as the rucksack. I, I pass that on to the old man. Oh, um, and it's just a locker in there. His, you, his blind bag's a disaster. You brought a legit rucksack to the blind before, right? That, it not, was, it was a duck commander branded, but it's, I'm not exaggerating. It was like a full ruck. <laughs> I think I had four boxes of shells in there. <laughs> because one thing is that I shoot a lot and I miss a lot. So I need I need multiple options. I also experiment with the um the combination of Winchester, Remington, shells and my shotgun at any given time to see if that combination gives us any luck. <laughs> <laughs> what about Rio? You yeah, don't shoot luck. Rios. You had bad luck with Rio, right? Another important lesson. <clears throat> I always have a boar snake in my blind bag now because my dad and I were hunting and we were just crushing ducks. We shot a limit, I think, in an hour, four guys. And um, midway through, he was shooting Rios and the casing became dislodged when he shot and it got stuck in his barrel. Mm. And he, he couldn't get it out. So he had to take his gun apart and he had a stick and he got a stick and it got the the shell out of the, it was like halfway through the barrel. So now I always have a war stick in there. Oh, geez. That could have been a disaster mm-hmm. if that was shot one of three or two of three. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry to any of the uh, Rio hunters out there, but not my bag anymore. Hmm. So, talk, you know, you've talked about when you made the decision to buy quality gear because of you, you know, being cold and all that kind of stuff. But I know you've also kind of gone through the, progression of buying calls and you know 
looking yeah. into stuff about buying your, you know, building a spread and just kind of uh, all the, you know, the waiters thing you've gone through that. Uh, talk a little bit about that journey and sort of, you know, how that's been, because although, you know, we talk a lot about these kinds of things and bounce ideas off each other and all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of times, at least for you getting started, you know, you were in a, in a position that a lot of guys are in, in the sense that, okay, I'm getting started in waterfowl hunting. I like it. I still do primarily archery or turkey or whatever, but I'm starting to get into waterfowl and I want to do it more, but I'm trying to decide like how much money I want to spend on it. And like, what, where, where's the break even point on what you're spending for what you're getting and all that kind of stuff. And I know for a while you were picking up stuff when it would be like on sale on camo uh, fire, you know, there'd be a deal running, you'd pick something up and you'd use it and how you'd like it or you didn't or whatever. But I think a lot of guys can relate to that, to that, uh, you know, that kind of experience and that sort of, uh, period of time where you're like not 100% committed yet and you're still really super budget minded, whatever. Um, so talk a little bit about that process and kind of some of the things that worked for you and some of the things that didn't. Yeah. So, um, so when I decided to really get into waterfowl hunting, the first thing I did was I wanted to be sure that I could stay in the blind. So, um, I, the, I, I, my first investment was in a good shell outer coat. Um, it's the Sitka Hudson, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and then, and then some other gear that, um, was either Gore-Tex or good insulation pieces that I could stay warm with. Um, and I think actually that Hudson is the first hunting jacket that I had that was Gore-Tex. And I, I can't believe that I ever hunted even whitetail because you're, you know, it can be rainy and cold. Um, and Gore-Tex was just a complete game changer for me. So that was number one. And I was lucky because, um, my dad has many firearms. So I always had, uh, an option. So I really, I, I hunted with, uh, uh, Remington 1100 that my dad bought in 1979 I think it was actually a wedding present for himself. I'm not sure. <laughs> for himself. <laughs> <laughs> that but sounds about right. I killed a lot of turkeys with that gun, so I thought, oh, with a modified choke, I can kill a lot of geese and ducks with it. And I did. Um, but after that, I decided to um, buy a waterfowl gun, a good um, semi-auto loader. And so the first one I bought was a Beretta A300 because the price point was right. And Josh, I think you had just bought one and you were happy with yours. Yep. And so that's what I decided to go with. And I, that gun has never failed me. Um, I love that gun. It fits me right. It's actually got some adjustments that you can make to it. I think you talked about that too a couple of ep- episodes ago. Um, and then I bought a Pattern Master Choke. So that was uh, my, like I would call it my second big investment. But the thing that when I really decided to do it or get into waterfowl was... Um, I was always waiting on Dan to call me to go hunting. I was like, you know, a high schooler waiting by the phone. Is Dan going to call tonight? Are we going to go hunting in the morning? Are we going to have a date? Um, and so, because I didn't have a spread and I couldn't run a duck or a goose call. Um, so, I decided that if I wanted to do this, I couldn't be completely beholden to Dan's schedule <laughs> and its fickle nature. But, um, so I, I went on, I think it was... Uh, the Sierra Trading Post. I had some success in there buying some Sitka gear at a at a decent price. So I was just trolling around, and there was an acrylic banded uh, call, and I got it for like fifty bucks. And I sent it to Dan. I was like, "Is this a good? Is this a good price?" He's like, "Is it acrylic?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Yeah, buy it." Um, and what I would do is I <laughs> I would. But I had a long drive to work at that time. I was driving like an hour to work. So I would just try to run, I would try to make duck sounds out of this call and I couldn't do it and I couldn't do it. And then finally it clicked and, or I thought in my mind it clicked. And so I would take videos of myself <laughs> with this duck call and send it to you and Dan. And so say, many is videos. This, what, is so this, many videos. <laughs> is this the sound that a duck makes? And you guys are like, no. <laughs> and so now I can't really run a duck call to the point where I'm completely confident in it. But I think I sometimes can be a good supplement to Dan in the mm-hmm. blind. For sure. I got a good hail call, I think. <laughs> um, and then and then I bought a, a goose call too. I still not in, in still because like I said, I don't really hunt geese, and so it hasn't been a priority. But just recently, really excited. Part of that care package that you were talking about that I came home to 
was a new call from 737. Mm -hmm. um, it's got the HP logo on it. Yeah, so yeah. I was, I, when I was at the, at the Mars this morning, that's why I was, went out there. I wanted to run the call a little <laughs> bit to see if I could get any response. Um, so really fired up about that. I'm excited to, to get that going. And then I think last year was the first year I started to build my spread. Well, maybe two years ago when I bought those six divers when Dan and I decided <laughs> to go diver hunting. So I bought six bluebills and then traded them for 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 mallards. For mallards. <laughs> um, and now I've got I think I've got three dozen um, mixed bag of of black ducks and mallards and um, one less black duck after this. You well, that year. brings up another story because I was really proud of that super black eagle two that I bought um, and I patterned it and I thought it was shooting pretty good the, when I first took it out and. Um, I had a pattern master in that too, but that story that you told about me shooting the head of my off the my black duck um, decoy was the reason that I decided to I needed to make a change um, because I believe that I was aimed at the live duck, <laughs> <laughs> but I shot the head off of one of the decoys that was next to the live oh duck, and it was probably. I don't know, 18 inches to the left of the live duck. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, I, because, you know, I, I, I can, I miss a lot, but I shouldn't miss that duck. And so I sent it back to Benelli and they, they were great about it. Um, but I've actually had a couple issues with it. One was the ejection issue that I hope is fixed. But, um, this, this lady, they had to replace the entire, um, barrel and, um, well, the receiver is connected to the barrel and those, and it's actually pretty sick, slick um, design. It makes it really easy to take apart um, and put back together and see what's going on. But they had to replace the whole thing. So actually, one of the things that I'm home this week, I want to try to shoot that gun to see if it's patterning any better. Oh, nice. I was uh, wondering about that because yeah. I know you sent it back. They replaced it. Wow. Yeah. They were, yeah. They said it was – they said the um, – whatever the right ratio is, 80-20 or whatever it is – um, it was way off. So hopefully I'll be shooting a little better. Otherwise I'll just go back to the A300 and I know that thing's a killer. Yeah. I think that story is like that. the, the third, like definite defining moment of your waterfowl career that you've talked about today. It's like every story, I feel like it's it, at some point you hit that. And that's when I knew I had to make a change. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's when I knew. Like I said, I'm not willing to, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not willing to, to sit around. You're not going to settle. He <laughs> I will not settle. settle. Perfection <laughs> is the goal here. Where, um, where, think, where are you I at right now? Be. Where are you at right now with waiters? I know you've, um, you did the, the gander deal. You went, you got, you had some, uh, gator waiters at one point. Where, where are you at now with that? Well, I didn't feel like I could be friends or hunt with you guys unless I went with bre breathable waiters <laughs> two years ago. Oh. So I, I think if I showed up in neoprenes, then then I would have just been thrown out of the blind. But <laughs> actually, in all seriousness, um, those those gander waiters suited me fine for the amount of hunting that I was doing. I was just really cold in them. Yeah. Um, so I went with gator waders, and uh, actually, I I. It, I think it was on Facebook and there was a gator waiter advertisement. So I was, I was in the market for waiters and I bought the Dr. Duck waiters and they're actually really good waiters. Um, they're, they've got like an insulation uh, piece in them, which I think helps, but the boot in those is not great. I think they could have probably invested a little more in the boot, uh, but the waiters overall have held up really, really well. I've hunted pretty hard with them the last two years and I think they're still going strong. Um, but I am intrigued by the Sitka waiters and mm -hmm. the lacrosse boot. I thought you might. Yeah, yeah. Get a so perked up there. If when I come back from overseas, I'll maybe I uh, maybe I'll make the investment in those. But the Gator waiters are good, um, and I, I am a full convert from neoprenes to breathables as yeah. well. Well, that being said, this past year we hunted some cold mornings, mm -hmm. and you were literally down in the water, like waist deep. Yep, standing the entire hunt. Mm -hmm. That's how. That's kind of how we hid. We had one. Uh, a fast strike blind, then Trav kind of moved down because birds were landing a little off of us too, and look over and he's waist deep in water, no no foot adjustments or anything. It was it was relaxing. Yeah, I was totally fine, and that was I don't know, fifteen degree day or yeah, whatever. It was frosty. It was frosty, and that I tell you what, if waders can hold up through that, I actually got a hole in my sims, and I think it's from that place, just from falling through. Falling through, and I I don't know, if, I don't know if people understand 
kind of the places we hunt. Like that one you were talking about where we were rowing and those big mallards, but that is like literally floating vegetation on seven or eight feet of water. Mm-hmm. Oh, that swamp doesn't have bottom. No, and there's no bottom. So if you touch the bottom, I mean, it's just a very dangerous place to hunt, but we do it and there's a lot of birds there. But this other place too, same thing, it's a floating vegetation and you fall through and it sticks and stuff. And uh, I mean, if you can make, if you hunt there more than a couple of times and, and don't cut your waders in half, it's pretty impressive. But I did have one little hole that, um, I found before I went to Maine and they have a little patch set that comes with the Sims waders and patched up at zero issue whatsoever going up there. But yeah, I thought, you know, you were, you were down in the water and, and not having a hole in your waders was pretty impressive for, for that area. That's yeah. that's just hard to hunt there. It is hard, but that's where the birds are. I mean, yeah. it's hard to walk. I think if um if I could shoot better and you would remember your jerk rig <laughs> string <laughs> or your blind bag, <laughs> then we would have had some pretty bang up days. <laughs> but I talked about my my issues last year just forgetting everything and I had it usually I put it in a truck. I set stuff on my four-wheeler which was right next to my truck and Literally just for getting stuff nonstop last year. And on top of that, I had, um, it was my long line instead of the jerk rig when I took it out there. That was one of the hunts where yep. I just started. But the the long line, it did work on this teal. As, as soon yep. as you hit those teal, the that quote unquote jerk rig Vega came pouring <laughs> in. That was my first green wing too. Yeah. Those are pretty. Those are pretty. Was it? No, your dad was there on that one. No, he wasn't there on that one. He wasn't there? Mm -mm. No. So that's my, my, my journey to becoming a waterfowl hunter. So, um, I think that, I think next step is to continue to build the spread. I don't have any, um, goose decoys, but I might get some, uh, get some of those just for some confidence. Some floaters. Yeah. Yeah. I am excited because, um, now that I'm actually looking for ducks in particular, we are kind of expanding our areas that we can hunt. So um, there's some new spots we need to try out. That one spot, um, we haven't really hit it right, but that's probably going to be be the honey hole next year. Yep. Okay, so it's obviously you know been a several-year progression. And I think that's also one thing that a lot of guys become overwhelmed with when they start out waterfowl hunting is that they get, they, they start getting into it and look at all the stuff that goes into it. And they're like, Holy smokes, you know, this is going to cost me a lot of money to get the camo, the guns, the waders, the decoys, the all, you know, all the other stuff that goes into it. Um, what's, what's kind of been your approach to that in the sense that obviously, you know, whether you're hunting with Dan or going on a guided hunt or something, you know, they've, they've got, gear that you can use as far as like decoys and things like that. But obviously everybody kind of has the feel that they want to get on their own and be able to do it on their own a little bit. So sort of what's, what's been your approach to that, you know, the, the procurement of all the gear and kind of balancing the cost, because as you mentioned, you still, you know, like the elk hunt, which is, you know, is not a cheap sport to do as well. So there's, there's gear that goes into that. You've got two kids, you know, you've got a family to support. You've got all that going on. You know, what's kind of been your, uh, you know, your approach to managing that sort of ramp up process? Um, I think if you, if you follow the right stores and you can hit the, uh, the sales, right, then you could, you can break it up over the course of a year. I think I'm probably, I don't know, still three or four years away from having everything that I think I could, I can need. Um, the spots that I hunt, you have typically have to walk quite a ways to get to. So you need to, I need to travel pretty light. Um, but I think the next step is probably building out maybe a diver spread or two, um, (laughs) alongside Dan, but it's, um, I think that if you, if you, what I did is I made a list of everything that I needed or I thought I needed. And then if I'm on tangle free or uh, Rogers or something like that, and there's a sale on, floating decoys or whatever in it. If my budget's right, then I'll, I'll purchase them. But I sort of, like I said, I think I, I kind of made a plan on what I wanted to, to first I needed to feel comfortable in the blind. 
I needed to be able to, you know, have a reliable gun. Then I wanted to be able to run a call. And now it's about building the spread. So that was sort of the four step process. That's Travis Laird's four step process <laughs> to being a waterfowl hunter. <laughs> Patent pending. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think, I don't know. I, uh, um, I can tell you that all I really think about in the fall is the next time that I'm going to be in the blind. And I think that's, even if we don't have a good hunt, um, I always think that we're going to have a good hunt the next morning. Um, and the day that I lose that feeling is probably the day I'll stop hunting. It's like my, I don't know if this is that family friendly, but my dad says the day he stops um, getting excited about the feeling of pulling a trigger and, trigger and seeing a turkey's head snap back <laughs> is the day he'll stop hunting. That's kind of how right. I am with waterfowl. If I'm not getting excited about it, then I'm not going to go. So yeah, there's there's a couple things that you hit right there that I think really resonate with me. One, I've been this way for a long time, but I make I make lists for everything. My wife will tell you, I have a notebook where I keep lists of just things that I want to get and there's no really, there's no time date on it, but things that I want for waterfowl hunting, things that I want for photography, things that I want for archery, whatever it is, I just keep a running list so that, you know, if I get a gift card for my birthday or a Christmas present or something like that, I'll go to that list. And what I prioritize as far as what I want to buy kind of, it changes over time. And, you know, you just make the kind of the best decision based on where you're at at that point. But I like to keep those lists because it sort of keeps me focused on the big picture of sort of where I want to, where I want to go with my gear and that kind of thing. But, but further to that end, when you talk about, you know, in the fall, thinking about the next time you're going to be in the blind, I, I, I mean, you know, again, we all kind of grew up hunting archery, uh, white tails and still all do it and like it a lot, but you know, there's, there's days when I'm in a tree stand in the morning in the fall, if I'm not seeing deer, you can guarantee that what I'm thinking about at that moment is I'd much rather be duck hunting because no doubt, even, even on the mornings where it doesn't go good, it still beats, you know, that for me to where, you know, we're spending time in the blind, you know, chewing the fat, cutting up, you know, having a good time, whatever. Uh, I don't got to worry about the scent on my clothes. I can, you know, drink coffee. I can get out and take a leak if I want to, like, it's no big deal. Um, you know, those, those times are really I mean, as much as I enjoyed the action in, you know, like we talked about before, like the interaction of birds coming into the blind and the rush and the feel that that gives you, you know, the, the feeling of the downtime is, is way better for me, you know, with waterfowl. And that's, that's ultimately what, what drew me to the sport more than anything. And I also think it's a, it's a great opportunity to get younger kids into the sport of, of being, of hunting and being in the outdoors for the same exact reason. You know, they don't have to worry about holding still and, you know, moving their head slow and not talking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it just seems like, you know, it's, if we could do better at, uh, you know, facilitating access for, for people to take youth hunters and stuff, we'd have a much better recruitment rate by focusing their, their attention on waterfowl and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, I get it. Deer, deer is a much more abundant species across the entire country and there's more opportunities to hunt them across the entire country. But, uh, you know, as far as the experience itself, I don't think that it's something that can be rivaled when you're talking about waterfowl hunting. And I think you're a perfect example of that. And as am I, that all it takes is just an opportunity to get out there and do it. And then it just kind of hooks you. Yeah, no doubt. And like I said, we've talked about my dad a lot. Um, the, his call sign in the seventies was, from his CB radio was a pencil, Pennsylvania toe tapper. So we call him toe tap. But if it wasn't for him, I mean, I don't know what, I, I just can't imagine my life, um, and not being a hunter. I think, um, and I think that if you, like you say, Josh, if you expose young people to it, um, especially waterfowl hunting, because it, there's a social aspect to it that you don't get in, in deer hunting, unless you go to like a hunting camp, um, but I remember thinking in high school or whatever, when I would want to go deer hunting and there was a couple guys that duck hunted and I just couldn't, I was like, why do they want to duck hunt? Um, and I really wish, um, that I would have gone earlier on. My, I'm actually, my grandfather was a big duck hunter. Um, and then he had to stop hunting, but, uh, I'm really, I'm really thankful that I found waterfowl hunting and thankful for you guys for introducing to me, me to it because I probably still wouldn't be waterfowl hunting unless you both were, um, going, getting after it in that one, that first trip down to the shore. 
So thanks. I also want to thank you guys for doing the podcast because uh, living 3,000 miles away, you're always looking for things that remind you of home. And um, so I'm probably one of the first downloads that you guys get because uh, <laughs> I'm five hours ahead. <laughs> so whenever I get the notification, of doing the, and you guys are doing an awesome job to see what you guys have, have put together is really impressive. So I'm excited to see what you guys do in the future. You feel like you're sitting at home. So let's go back to, I know we're talking hunting and everything, but let's talk about some of the first times we met and maybe our, our journey through sports together and uh, some competition. Because for those, well, Josh said, but Trav and Josh went to the same high school, which was a rival high school from Linesville, where I went. And pretty much we were always playing against each other, knew of each other, but then probably Legion time when we could drive and we actually started hanging out. And, and I think one of the first times we hunted together or were in the woods together, we were playing uh, paintball and they set me up and uh, both attacked me from, <laughs> from different <laughs> angles and just lit me up. Especially, I think Josh was aiming at my nether regions and I got, I got pepper. So let me, let me, let me, let me, here, let me right? give Yeah. Let me give a little, little background to that, that little ditty. We were playing capture the flag behind Travis's house and I was laid down in this. His dad would brush, brush hog trails back there. And I was laying along the one side of it in a, in the weeds. And our flag was kind of down at the end and Dan comes sneaking up the logging road. And I had a little BB gun scope on my, my paintball gun that, you know, it, the paintballs boomerang everywhere. They go whatever. So it was, it, I don't know what I was trying to do with it, but I see you come sneaking up and I put it, Right in the in the groin region, and I cut I cut I I cut that first one loose, and it hits true to the mark, and <laughs> it hits you. And as you're spinning, the second one was already on its way, also yeah. finds the mark. <laughs> so I was I was pretty proud of so, what I what I pulled off right there. Uh, yeah. So pretend it's like a Y, like, and I'm walking down one of the the top portions of the Y, and. I'm coming down and across, like, I, you guys ambushed me because there was someone Total shooting. Ambush. There's someone shooting, like, back in. So I'm, like, focused on them. Well, Josh, you were hiding in, like, thorn bushes and whatever else was there. So I'm not even looking. I'm looking at the guy that's shooting at me. And then as I got closer is when just out of nowhere just started getting peppered. And you didn't let up. I think I got hit four or five times. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pull well, the you gotta pull the trigger until the threat is neutralized. Okay. <laughs> that, that so, but Josh, you and I met, and you you have probably forgot about this, but I have not. <laughs> it, oh I think it was either 1989 or 1990. <laughs> we were on the same farm league team. Yeah, uh, baseball team. Yeah, Indians. And I think I was six, and I'm I'm standing there in the outfield and like having a catch or whatever, <laughs> and this kid shows up. And he's this giant kid. Is he driving a Mustang already? <laughs> I think he had a full beard and he's seven. <laughs> but he had this this wooden bat. And oh, it yeah. It was probably like, I don't know. It looked like a 36-inch bat. <laughs> it was it was a 30-incher. It was a 30-incher for a seven-year-old. Yeah. And it was like a Bobby Bonilla special. And everybody else was using metal bats. I couldn't understand why this, this person was using this wood bat. <laughs> it seemed so unfair. And Josh steps up to the plate, and that field didn't have a fence. It was just like a, you know, <laughs> so, so if you hit the ball in the outfield, it would just roll forever. And Josh would hit these liners into the outfield with this wood, this giant wooden bat. It looked, it was more than half your size, I think. And uh, and then we started playing baseball and, um, you know, hung out together quite a bit. But Dan and I, we met... I think we were 11 or 12 in like a, a school exchange program. Yeah. Um, but we, at that time we were playing little gritters and Dan was also a giant 12 year old. Like he's the same size as he is now. Same height, I think. And he was a, he was a middle linebacker <laughs> on the little gritters football team. And I was a running back and it was like a toss sweep or something like that. And I decided to turn up field, <laughs> put my foot in the ground and Dan just, lights me up i mean this this collision was so violent it and was. it was one way gave me a concussion no nah. i definitely had a concussion <laughs> a little cte never hurt anybody right 
<laughs> yeah, well, I've had many concussions, but that hit is still in my mind because when people say that, you know, if friends play together and are competitive, that they take it easy on the, on each other, that is not the case. That is not. You always go harder. <laughs> so in high school, um, I was always looking for my moment of opportunity to, to I was trying to knock Dan out. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to knock Dan out. <laughs> I never got I never got a clean shot, but um so that still sticks in my craw a little bit. Um that <laughs> that Dan gave me a concussion as a twelve year old. Um but then when we started playing ball together, it was it was uh a pretty natural uh friendship. And because we you know, all of us were hunters and we like to be outdoors and um Josh and I you and I hunted, you know, from pretty early on when we could when we were able to hunt. Mm-hmm. Missed a lot of deer. Yep. And out of the in the in the archery season, uh, and now it's and now it's um, now it's waterfowl hunting. So we'll see where the next thirty years takes us. Yeah, it's um, it's been interesting, man. And you know, it's funny because I think back to all the different you know hunts and stuff, and you know, it's just kind of like it, it never really mattered what, uh, what we were doing, you know, whether we were chasing deer with our bows or our flintlock muzzleloaders or chasing turkeys or, you know, waterfowl or whatever it is, you know, it all comes back to that, that friendship and the bond that you build with people through, you know, for us, it was through athletics and also through the outdoors. But, you know, I think that's what makes, you know, the culture a little bit different. And, you know, you talk about like what we have in the Facebook group and, you know, people, how it just, so easy to get in there and relate to what people are going through. I mean, I made a post the other day about having too many hobbies and all this kind of stuff. And just, you know, the amount of people that were like, Oh, you know, I can relate to that. And, you know, kind of offering their opinions and stuff. I think it's just, it's just one of those cool things that, you know, it's just yet another thing where I think to myself, you know, man, people that don't, maybe there are other ways to do it, but you know, people that don't spend time in the outdoors with their buddies like this, they don't know what this feels like. And, you know, I think that all the time, you know, when you, when you're sitting in the blind or you're sitting in the arch in the woods and you hear the, you know, the proverbial woods wake up and you see the sunrise and I'm like, man, you know, there's a lot of people around the world that never get to experience this. And, you know, it's unfortunate because, you know, it's a big part of life that they're missing out. And maybe there's parts of life that I'm missing out on too, but, um, you know, it's always one of those things where I come back and those are some of the fondest, fondest memories I might have of my childhood is, you know, all of us traveling around playing Legion baseball and, you know, chasing waterfowl and stuff. And I mean, those are the kinds of stories that, you know, you know, I'm 35, you know, some of these stories are, you know, pushing 20 years old now. And I'm probably still going to tell my group to my grandkids, you know, 30 years from now. So it's, it's just one of those things that kind of stay with you forever. And it's, uh, you know, it's just a community and a bond that a lot of people don't get to really uh, appreciate. I don't think. No doubt. No doubt. Some of those road trips that we were on were way more fun than playing the actual games um we were pretty good mike's hard lemonade trav were you yeah. with, were you with us on the day on the trip to harrisburg where we all rode in the back of dan's dad's truck yeah for like yeah. five yeah, that was however like, that was like five some hours and we're laying in the bed of his truck <laughs> the whole i was way. thinking about that actually the other day it's pretty safe <laughs> the the fact that the three of us were on an air mattress air in the mattress back, in the back. leaning up against coolers and luggage <laughs> We're on the, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. <laughs> yeah, that no was seat belts or anything. That was that's hilarious. <laughs> Actually, that was my preferred method to travel. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Just, Just lounge, out, chill out. <laughs> Just lounging. Just yeah, lounging. Tra- Travis was. You were also the uh, the third party privy to me beating down Dan in my sleep. I was I at, you guys at St. Mary's. You, you've you've been you told you were, that story. Yep. I was in the room. It is a true story <laughs> that um, Josh had some kind of night terror that <laughs> led him to believe that Dan was a threat, and there were many elbows thrown. <laughs> did I don't think I did I wake you up? Uh, well, I, that level of commotion, nobody could have stayed asleep because Josh was beating you up and you were screaming, "Josh, Josh, <laughs> what are you doing?" Very high pitched voice. Very. Um, but and then I just kind of woke up and it it seemed like everything died down, so I just went back to sleep. And I think <laughs> the next morning I said, "Guys, what happened last night?" And then you proceeded to tell me that Dan elbowed you and uh, tried to, I think, smother you. Maybe tried to try to no. choke you out. <laughs> no, it was straight straight forearms. And then 
You finally woke up. Sorry. I thought you were Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got a few people's elbows from me. <laughs> well, he probably deserved it. Probably did. It was retribution for his concussion probably. that he that so he put onto you. So much. <laughs> You put a hit on me. So much absorbing Junior on those trips. Yeah. Yeah, they were good times. They were good times. But um, I think about that. I think about those trips a lot um, and all all positive and good memories and really thankful that, uh, you know, I have you guys to rely on um, wherever I'm at. But I think the big thing is because I live in London now. Dan lives in Linesville. Josh, you live in Virginia. Um, my base is in Cleveland, so I'm somewhat close to Dan. Um, but, you know, we can get on a phone call and whether it's this podcast or whatever, or being in a hunting blind, and it's just like we never left. Um, so it's, uh, it's really been a positive force in my life. And I think that um, most of it... Like, we talked about my dad too, but, um, that's what my dad and I do. You know, we go out when I'm home and it's hunting season, we are hunting and my mom is typically with us too. Um, and I, I'm so excited to go out to Northwest Colorado in September. And so my dad's 63 and my mom is 62 and they get after those Hills just as good as I do. And, uh, and I'm always amazed that they can do that. And they're totally beat up too. (laughs) <laughs> like my dad's had four or five knee surgeries and uh shoulder surgery, but he's still he still's got the drive and I hope when I'm sixty three that I've got the same drive that he has. Yeah. That's what's always impressed me about your dad. I remember in high school he had a knee surgery, I believe yeah, it was during baseball season, high school baseball season, and I remember him being on crutches and sure enough he'd be taking those crutches out to the turkey woods <laughs> out back of your house. And, uh, I remember the doctor not being a big fan of that and telling him to take it easy, but it was turkey season. So, uh, you know, I can't, you know, <clears throat> it's so funny, man. And I know we've talked about your dad a lot, but you know, he's played a big role, you know, in a lot of, you know, for all of us, you know, in our lives and stuff. And I can remember driving the back roads with your dad, um, you know, in the springtime after, you know, after baseball practice or whatever it was. And we would just hit parking lots of the, the public areas and we would just, get out of the truck. He'd cut a few times on the call and like, he'd hear a Turkey gobble. Like I can't even, you know, I couldn't even have the time here. He's like, Oh yep, Turkey right there. We're going to be on him in the morning. Like I just remember driving around hitting these spots. And I'm thinking like, man, he's just got this game figured out. Like he just knows what he's doing. And, um, you know, it's just, we, we had a post in the listeners group a, a, f- a few weeks ago about, you know, the people that have been influential in your life. And as far as getting in the kitchen and hunting and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's just, I feel fortunate that, you know, to have got to hunt with your dad and, and cause I, I do believe he's one of the best outdoorsmen I've ever been around. And, um, you know, those are just things that kind of stick with you, man. And you always, you always remember them. And I hope that, you know, as I'm, as I'm getting older and, you know, have my own kids and stuff that I, you know, I'm able to kind of have the same impact on them. And, uh, you know, like you talked about, man, I mean, I look, I look forward to hunting with your dad as much as I look forward to hunting with you. No, I mean, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, I look at your dad as one of, you know, he's just one of the guys and, you know, a guy that I look forward to having in the blind. So, um, you know, I think it's really cool when you can kind of pull all the different, you know, experiences and the, and everything together. And we've been able to do that. And I think with the introduction of waterfowl hunting, we've been able to do that even more so. And, um, you know, and that's the thing too about waterfowl hunting is, you know, as your dad gets a little bit older, it's less impact on him. So it's not like you're humping, you know, the mountains out in Colorado all the time and, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Not that, not that he would ever take his foot off the gas. We'd have to force him to kind of like, you know, chill out a little bit, but it's something that we could do for a long time, you know, regardless of, you know, as long as he can get into a boat or whatever, I mean, we can have him out and I'm sure he'll be ready to go, uh, you know. Yeah, for sure. So Two quick stories about my dad that, exe- that describe him to a T. So last night we're going to dinner. And my wife and kids are in the car and my mom and dad are in the car and I'm driving my dad's in the front seat and we're on our way to dinner and, um, on, on this main road. So I'm driving 60 miles an hour and the, the vegetation in the woods, you know, around the road is really thick. And he's talking on the phone to his friend, talking about our Colorado trip actually. And he's, he, he's looking straight. He, he's not even looking around (laughs) 
and all I just see is his finger just point directly to the left. And I look over there and there's a deer like 30 <laughs> yards in the woods. I have no idea how he saw it. Yep. And I thought, oh, that's, that's my dad to a nutshell, but he one-upped himself on the way home. So the, the circumstances in which the reason that we had to come home are, are kind of sad. But um, my wife was talking about this really lovely story about her grandma who just recently passed away. And, um, you know, it was kind of an emotional story and we're all listening to it and thinking about Dorothy and, um, we're driving home and it's like dusk. So it's just about the time my dad calls it bewitching hour. Yep. Um, in the middle of the story that Jan is telling, my dad goes, look, there's four deer right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then it just went, and then just went completely silent. That was, that's all he had to say. But if there is a deer or any type of wildlife around, uh, he will see it and he will let you know oh that my, that animal oh my was God. there. And then that, did she finished the story. Is, yeah, she finished oh it. Yeah. Just, oh, that story is nails right there. That is definitely your dad. <laughs> Four deer. <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. He's oh. a character. Oh man. And th- the other thing too about when we go to Colorado, you know, some <laughs> some some of the areas that we hunt are really steep. And uh, oh man, I could get into so many stories about my dad, but what an adventure. Um, <laughs> yeah. It could be like we're near death. <laughs> you know, if we make one false step, we're going down this mountain. And um I think I think it was the first night we were at, this was a couple years ago. And I was walking down this trail and I slipped and I grabbed this tree. And if I didn't grab this tree, then I was going to go down this hill in a bad way. And my dad just looks at me and goes, what an adventure. <laughs> oh, man. So I might, I might have to make another journey over here when toe taps around and just hit the record button and let him talk for a couple hours. Yeah. He is one of the best storytellers out there. Yeah, and the so thing is, is that one story will take up an entire podcast. <laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> he loves me. detail in his stories. <laughs> you feel like you're there, though. You do. There's no doubt. You do. He's uh, he's something else. But now, and it's actually good because um, I didn't know if he would want to get into waterfowl hunting. But I think it's just because I like to do it now. And... He, he and so he likes to do it now, and we, it's just another reason for us to go and wake up early and spend some time together. And typically, Dan Dan's around in the mix. Josh, you've been in the mix too, so uh, it's always it's always a good time when all of us can get together and and be in a duck blind together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. I think I'll be hunting with him quite a bit this year. We plan on putting a blind up and be ready when you get when yeah you get i'm back. expecting you to build a blind so <laughs> it better it better too. be ready when i come back <laughs> me too so hmm. what do you think josh we're sitting here at the the counter and in his house and good to hour and 13 minutes in here yep and i know when it's when you give me uh the the uh episode time update that it's about that time that we we should wrap it up and actually um you know, again, we've we've been recording it at weird times because we've got some conflicting schedules and stuff going on. But uh, today, I'm getting ready to take my son to go see the new uh, Jurassic movie or whatever. Mm. I don't know which one that is, but we're gonna go see it. So um, I got to start getting ready to go do that. But um, you know, we wanted to take advantage of of Travis being home and talk a little bit about kind of his journey into becoming a full fledged waterfowl hunter, and you know, just kind of share some stories that, you know, can relate to both of us because, you know, we've, we've all been, you know, friends for so long. And, you know, I know Dan will refer to Trav in episodes like, oh yeah, me and Trav were hunting or whatever. And it's always good to give some context to people as to who, you know, who we're talking about with that kind of stuff. So I'm glad we were able to get, get Trav on. And, um, you know, I think, you know, as, as time goes by, man, it's like, uh, you know, like I, I think about the other day and I was like thinking about how long, you know, how long it's been since I graduated college. And now I'm like, holy crap, you know, I'm turning 35 and it's like, before I know it, I'll be turning 45. And it's like, you know, life just got, kind of goes by so fast and it's fun to just sort of take a minute and just kind of reminisce about old stories. And, you know, it's something we haven't been able to do for a while. So I'm glad we were able to do that on, on this episode and kind of share that with everybody else. Um, either one of you guys got anything else to uh, add here before we wrap it up? No, thanks for having me on. It, it's it's actually has been a dream come true. 
to be on this podcast with you guys. Here we go. Here we but, go. But seriously, <laughs> seriously, I I am really proud of you guys. Um, and I love the podcast and I love what you're doing. And I, thanks for getting me into waterfowl hunting. And uh, I look forward to this podcast every week now that it's weekly. Love that. Um, but keep it up, guys. I think it, I think it's great. I'm really proud of you. Yeah, this has been a, an hour of, well, we were on a little bit before um, before we started recording and just talking about things that we weren't going to talk about on the episode just because people won't know what we're talking about. But it just, you know, you're right back in the blind, even though you're you're through a headset right now, Josh. But, yeah, we need to get everyone together again and, you know, keep, keep making those uh, memories because they're fun. And I like to giggle, I guess. <laughs> I'm a giggler. Giggler. Dan and mo- and is like breather. in a constant. Dan's in a constant state of giggle, whether whether it's audible or not. He's yeah. just always. I'm happy. Smiling. Man. This is my happy place. <laughs> <laughs> always, always that chuckle. Chuckling. They just <laughs> <laughs> going on. <laughs> All right, Joshua. Yeah, good to talk to you, brother. Danimal. Good seeing you. Yeah. Likewise. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Travis. And again, everybody, this week's. Episodes brought to you by White Rock Decoys, Gunner Kennels, Lucky Duck Decoys, Camp Chef, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Southern Oak Kennels, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. Uh, we appreciate all of their support. So if you're in the market for any of uh, any waterfowl equipment or gear, definitely check out the uh, sponsors of this show. Make sure you head over to the HP Outdoors website, check out our discount code page, find out how you can save 10% off at Dunn Sporting Goods, 15% off with Black Rifle Coffee Company, 10% off with White Rock Decoys and get a special discount on a custom HP Outdoors waterfowl duck or goose call with 737 call. So appreciate the support of all of the companies and appreciate Travis uh, joining us this week. So let's go ahead and uh, put a bow on this one. That's going to do it for episode 91 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. Make sure you head over to iTunes, check out all of our past episodes, help us out with a five-star rating and review. It'll help other waterfowl hunters just like you find our show more easily thank you to travis for joining us this week and kind of helping us go down memory lane a little bit and talk about what it goes into sort of making a waterfowl hunter and going through that conversion so enjoyed his time on the show be sure to tune in next week for a new episode brand new content for dan i'm josh take care take care